to the one who has risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, and now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, where he rules until the day when he will come to judge the living and the dead. To him alone be glory and power and thanks to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So today is the celebration of Ascension. Ascension was actually on Thursday. And 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead, after 40 days of appearing to his disciples and to many others to prove that he was alive and that he had defeated sin, death, and the devil, after those 40 days, Jesus returns to heaven. We rightly spend a lot of our time discussing Jesus' work on earth, how he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a perfect life for us, and then suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. But now that Jesus is back in heaven, what's he doing there? I can tell you he's not relaxing at the beach trying to get a suntan, and he's not out fishing, and he's not taking a nap. In fact, just as he did while he was on earth, Jesus continues to serve you as both Lord and and Savior. One of the ways that the Bible helps us understand the work that Jesus has done and continues to do for us is to speak of his three offices, which are listed there for you on the screen. And, and we usually put them in this order. That's not the order we're going to discuss them today. But, but the Bible describes Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. And, and so today we want to look more closely at each of those offices to better understand how Jesus continues to serve us even while he is in heaven. So let's start with the office of a priest. A priest represents the people before God. In fact, we symbolize that in church whenever the pastor faces the altar, which is the presence of God, and speaks on behalf of the people. Like when we speak a prayer and you get to say, I agree with amen. A priest did that mainly two ways. And the first way, especially in the Old Testament, was by offering a sacrifice, a bloody payment for sin. And so every morning and every evening and at different times throughout the year, sometimes on a voluntary basis, sometimes at prescribed times, the people would come to church, to the temple, and they would bring a bull or a goat or a lamb or, or sometimes a bird, and they would give that animal to the priest who would take its blood and sometimes pour it out at the altar and other times just burn the animal on the altar. And that sacrifice was a reminder that God demands blood and death for sin. <coughs> now, we don't sacrifice like that anymore, and I'm pretty happy about that because I wouldn't be too excited about gutting all of your animals and burning them on an altar. But we do need that kind of priest, don't we? Because we are born sinful and live in sin every day, we are divided from God at birth. I Isaiah says that our sin separates us from God. And so we needed a priest who would offer a sacrifice to take away our sin and give us access to God, restore a relationship with God. And, but we needed a priest more than the Old Testament priests because no bloody sacrifice of a bull or a goat or a lamb could ever actually pay for sin. And that's why the priest never stopped sacrificing in the Old Testament. We need a priest who can offer a sacrifice that is greater than any amount of gold or silver we could ever bring. We need a priest who can offer a sacrifice that is greater than any good works that we could offer to God. We needed Jesus as our priest. When Jesus came to earth, he not only became our priest, he also became the sacrifice. John said he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came to offer not just the blood of an animal or even the blood of another man. Jesus came to offer the blood of the Son of God who had become man so that he could sacrifice himself for our sin. And when Jesus died on the cross, he made the final sacrifice once and for all. And so now we no longer need to offer sacrifices to God. 
And don't let the devil think you that by showing up at church, you have somehow given some sacrifice to God or, or by putting a dollar in the offering plate or, or by helping your neighbor. Those are no longer sacrifices as payment for sins. Those are now thank offerings because of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Now that's how Jesus was a priest on earth. The second job of a priest is to pray. And Jesus certainly prayed for us while he was on earth. And, and we can see Jesus praying uh, in, in John. He talks about that uh, the night he was betrayed. Jesus prayed for his disciples and for all believers. He was even praying for us. But now that Jesus is in heaven, he continues to serve as priest by praying for you. So what prayer do you think Jesus offers on your behalf? Might it be the first prayer that he offered while he was hanging on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing? You ever think about this? Whenever we sin, probably before we even recognize that we've sinned or, or at least before we're ready to confess and acknowledge that we have sinned, Jesus, sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, has already turned to his Father and said, Father, forgive them. Not just because they don't know what they're doing, but because, Father, I have already offered the sacrifice as payment for their sin. And so before we ever recognize our sin, before we ever come to God and say, God, I am sinful, I've sinned, I don't deserve anything, but please have mercy on me. Before we ever ask, God has already granted forgiveness. Because your Savior Jesus prays for you. And certainly he doesn't only pray for your forgiveness, but he also prays that God would bless you in many other ways. Jesus is your priest. Jesus has also made you priests. In the sense that you now have the opportunity to pray for others too. You ever do that? We do that as a congregation. After the, after the sermon, we usually have the general prayer of the church. And, and towards the end of that, we will often give thanks to God today for mothers, for those who have been recently married or had children or celebrated an anniversary. We'll, we'll pray for those who are in the hospital or, or the family who has just recently lost a loved one. Do you ever do that in your personal life? There's a seminary professor who shared with us at a conference recently that he every day prays for a, a different segment of people in his life. And, and I don't remember the exact order, but, but for example, on Mondays, he might pray for his family, so his wife and his children. He even prays for his children's future spouses and future grandchildren. Maybe on Tuesday he prays for his colleagues, the fellow seminary professors or, or other pastors or missionaries throughout the world. On, on Wednesday, perhaps, he prays for government leaders, federal, state, and local. On, on Thursday, he, he prays for another group of people. You get the idea. You get to pray for others just as Jesus prays for you. Maybe you pray first of all that not only that God would forgive them, but that they would know that Jesus has made the payment for their sin too. That's the priest. Second office we want to consider this morning is the office of king. A king does two things as well. First, a king fights for his people, and then a king rules and governs. And while Jesus was on earth, he didn't really look like a king, did he? But in fact, we know Jesus was acting as a king fighting our enemies of sin, death, and the devil. And near the end of his life, Pontius Pilate asked him directly, Are you a king? And, but then Jesus told us why he doesn't look like a king. He said, My kingdom is of another world. We talked about this a little bit with the kids. We don't always think we need a king. Or maybe sometimes we just don't want a king because we want to be in charge, don't we? The devil tries to convince us that we have enough power and enough authority and enough control to take, take the reins of our life and, and be the, the captain of our soul and the, the master of our fate and our destiny. But it's really all a lie, isn't it? And 
and you already know that. As you grow older, you start to realize how little control you actually have. We have no control over sickness or disease. We have no control over even our financial destiny. You know, we're, we're telling our kids, go to school, get a degree, you'll get a good job. And then kids are coming out of college with these degrees and saying, I can't get a job. The stock market is supposed to go up, but sometimes it goes down. We don't have control. We don't have control over other people, do we? Why can't my husband act the way that I want? And, and why won't my children listen to me? We don't have control. And we certainly don't have control over sin or death because we can't stop either of them from happening. And yet we have a king. We have a king who has already defeated our enemies. Jesus defeated sin by never giving in to sin. Jesus defeated the devil when he crushed his head by his death on the cross. And Jesus defeated death when he rose from the dead. And now Jesus is in heaven with all power. And though we can't see him, he looks like a king. In fact, before Jesus ascended into heaven, remember what he said? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The Apostle Paul said it like this, The very power that God used to raise Christ from the dead, he has exerted and now seated Jesus at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion above every name, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything. Make no mistake about it, Jesus is in control. Jesus is in control of the world in general. A great example of that is just to look at governments. You might think, Trump, Clinton, how is this going to be good? And yet, Jesus says that regardless of who is the president of the United States of America, he is going to use them to carry out the plan for his other kingdom. The same way that Jesus used evil Roman empires and unbelieving governors like Pontius Pilate who thought they were doing what they were supposed to do, not necessarily what God wanted them to do, and yet God used them to carry out his plan to save us from our sin. Jesus is in control, but not just of the world in general. Jesus is also in control of your life. Now that doesn't mean that Jesus operates you like a puppet. He doesn't force you to do this or to do that. You do have the opportunity to make some choices. But Jesus promises that all things will work for your good. That doesn't mean that he approves of our sinful choices. But he promises that when we return to him in repentance, he not only forgives our sins, but he even will use the evil that we suffer, sickness and disease, broken lives, broken relationships, stock market crashes, whatever it may be, Jesus can use anything and everything to draw you closer to him. Because Jesus isn't the kind of king who came to make your life on earth a life without problems. Jesus' kingdom is of another world. Jesus came to be a king so that he could create a new heavens and a new earth without sin and take you to live with him there in that kingdom. And as I told the children, Jesus doesn't rule with sword. Jesus rules with his word. More than anything, Jesus wants to be the king of of your heart. He wants you to know that he has loved you enough to live and die for you and there to trust him that he will take care of all of the other issues in your life as well. And just as Jesus has made you a priest, he has also made you a king. Jesus has already said that one day you will rule with him in the new world that he creates. But even now, he gives you the opportunity to rule with him on earth by wielding the most powerful tool the world has ever seen, and that is God's word. You have the opportunity to spread God's kingdom to the hearts of others. And that takes us to the final office of prophet. It's easy to see how Jesus was a prophet while he was on earth, right? 
After he was baptized, Jesus spent three years preaching and teaching throughout the country of Israel and, and even in other places like Samaria. Sometimes Jesus preached in church in the synagogue on Saturday mornings and, and sometimes he preached during the week on a hillside or along the seashore. Sometimes he taught large crowds of people, sometimes just a few. Jesus came to tell everyone that he was the one that God promised to send as Savior from sin. But then Jesus passed that job on to others. Just before he ascended into heaven, after he had said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus passed some of that authority on to those who already believed in him. Perhaps not just to his 11 disciples, but maybe to hundreds of other believers when he was on a mountain in Galilee and he said, now you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching to obey everything I have commanded you. You and I needed a prophet. When we were born, again, because of our sin, we were born without knowledge of God. We didn't know who God was, what he has done for us. We certainly didn't know that God loved us enough to send his son to live and die for us. And yet, when Jesus told his disciples and those first other believers to go and make more disciples, they listened. And they went and told others who told others who told others. And from one generation to another, to another, to another, finally God sent a prophet to you. Maybe it was your mom or your dad. Maybe it was grandma or grandpa. Maybe it was aunts, uncles, or cousins. Maybe it was someone at work or at school or a neighbor by your house or just a stranger you had never met. But somewhere along the way, God sent a prophet to tell you that Jesus is your Savior. Probably many prophets, including pastors and teachers, Along the way, God has given you his scriptures so that you could know and believe in Jesus as your Savior. And now that you are someone who knows and believes in Jesus as Savior, he asks you to be the next round of prophets, to tell the next generation, to tell your children and grandchildren or your schoolmates, your co-workers, your family, friends, neighbors, and anyone you can find that Jesus paid for their sins too. Forty days after Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven. We've been waiting for him to return, to come and judge the world and create the new heavens and the new earth for almost 2,000 years now. What's he been doing? He continues to be your Savior. Sitting at the right hand of the Father, Jesus prays for you and asks the Father to forgive you all your sins. As king, Jesus continues to not only rule the world, he rules your life with the promise that all things will work out for your spiritual and eternal good. Jesus continues to offer you his word as a prophet and to send others to share his word with you. Jesus is your prophet, priest, and king. <clears throat> to the one who has risen from the dead and to the one who has ascended into heaven and now serves us, to him be glory and power and honor until the day when he returns to take us to be with him. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends our human understanding will guard your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. We now get to be prophets by confessing our faith in Jesus. Today we'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed presented for you on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 